I'd like to invite you, if you'd like, to turn with me to a familiar story in Mark chapter 14. You're going to turn there with me. It's where we're going to stay uh, most of the time today, I believe. And I wanted to speak about something that's really touched my heart as it regards how the Lord deals with someone who has failed. And we see here in the end of Mark's gospel how Peter failed the Lord many times. And it blessed me to see God's purpose in that. So if you would, please look with me at Mark chapter 14 and verse 27. It says, Jesus said to them, you will all fall away because it's written, I will strike down the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. But after I've been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. So he's told his disciples, all of you are going to fall away. But then it says, Peter said to him, even if all of these, these guys fall away, yet I will not. So Peter, one strike, the Lord warns him. He says, not me. And then the Lord speaks specifically to him in verse 30. Jesus said to him, truly, I say to you, Peter, this very night before a rooster crows twice, you yourself will deny me three times. So second warning. And then what does it say in verse 31? Peter kept saying insistently, even, I have to deny, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And they were all saying the same thing also. I, I wonder, children, if you think about a sibling that you've warned, you've said, hey, don't play with my toys. And they say, I'm not going to play with your toys. You say, no, every time I leave the room, you play with my toys. They say, no, no, I really won't. And then you look at this one sibling, you say, you're going to don't play with my toys. And they go, no, no, I won't. Would they be out of your club or off your team? I would think Jesus specifically warned Peter. You know, how does P Jesus respond? And it's, it's amazing. It says in Mark 14, verse 32, it says they came to a place named Des Gethsemane. And Jesus says to his disciples, to the other nine or eight, sit here until I have prayed. And then he took Peter, James, and John with him further. I see that the Lord kept Peter as a part of his inner circle, even though Jesus had warned him twice and Peter insisted, no, 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 your warning's off. Jesus didn't send him away. And I was struck by that because I was wondering, what does Jesus have in store for Peter? And uh, it struck me how Jesus doesn't give up on us. That's the first thing, that even when we ignore his warnings, even when we insist his warnings don't apply to us, he doesn't kick us off the team, but he does have a plan. And it really uh, struck me, this familiar scene in the Garden of Gethsemane, I believe the Lord had something he wanted to show me about how he works with the one who fails. If you look with me at verse 34, it says, Jesus said to his disciples, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch. And I was struck that Jesus, he brings Peter along and he asks him to do this very simple thing. Just keep watch. I told you you're going to deny me. Let's not worry about that right now. Just keep watch. Very simple instruction. And then it says uh, in, if you look at verse 37, he came and found them sleeping. And he said, not to all three, but to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? You who said that you wouldn't deny me even if everybody left. I just ask you this little bitty thing. Are you asleep? Couldn't you keep watch for an hour? And it struck me that the Lord saw Peter couldn't be faithful. Peter wasn't able to even obey a very simple command. And Jesus singled him out. It's good to know that when the Lord doesn't give up on us, he doesn't tell us everything's fine. We see that, that he brought Peter along, but he doesn't bring him along and say, hey, I want you to know it's all good. What does he do? He leads him into a situation where he gives him a very, very small responsibility and Peter fails. And it's good for us to see that God in his mercy will bring us into situations that he desires, he designs and desires to show us our inability. And that was Jesus' love. And anytime we find ourselves in situations where we see our own lack, 
That's Jesus' love. And it's good to appreciate that as a gift. You know, it says of the rich young ruler that he came to him and he asked him, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? And it says that Jesus looked at him with love and told him what he lacked. And Jesus looks at Peter, who has been insisting, I won't deny you. And he shows him his lack very clearly. You couldn't do this simple thing. You couldn't keep watch. And to me, it was, it was good to see that that's proof that he hadn't give up on Pe given up on Peter. And it's proof that he hasn't given up on us. If we see that God is pointing out something that's displeasing in our lives, if he's brought us into a circumstance where he's revealing something ugly, we should rejoice. Even if we hate what we see, even if we repent, we should also rejoice. Lord, it's your love that leads me into circumstances that reveal my inability. As Hebrews 12 says, he's treating you as sons. The Lord disciplines those he loves. Don't faint when you're reproved by him. Definitely thank the Lord, rejoice and say, you're showing me where I lack because you love me. So what happens next? We all are familiar with the story, but just think about it in the context that we've been considering here. Peter's insistent he's not going to deny Jesus. So Jesus gives him a little bitty assignment. And Jesus shows him his inability even to keep a small assignment. What happens next? We can think now that, now that Peter has clearly seen his lack, he straightens it up, he gets his act together. But look, it's, it, it says Jesus goes on to say, verse 38, keep watching and praying. I'm going to give you another try, Peter. Keep watching and praying. I'm going to go away again. Keep watching and praying. Again, small assignment. And you've just seen you can't do it. So now surely the knowledge that you can't do it and a second chance, surely this time you'll knock the cover off the ball. You'll knock the ball out of the park, right? But we know the story. Did proud Peter, who had been so insistent earlier, did he redouble his resolve? Did he heed Jesus' exhortation? Children, look at verse 40. It says again, Jesus came. This is the second time. And he found them sleeping again. Peter failed again. And you know what's, what struck me this time? It says at the end of verse 40, look with me. They didn't know what to answer him. Peter, before, he said, no, 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 no. You don't understand. These guys might fall away, not me. And Jesus says, no, you. And he says, no, not me. Now when he fails, he's, he doesn't have anything to say. It says he did not know what to answer him. And what, what spoke to me there is that the, part of the Lord's desire in bringing us into and through circumstances to eliminate our insistence on our ability and to bring us to a point of speechlessness. I believe it's a very important point in Peter's life when Peter couldn't, he's always got an answer. And now in this moment, he's speechless. And I believe that's a place that the Lord wants to bring all of us to. And that's part of the reason he designs and appoints circumstances in our lives to bring us to the point that we stop insisting on our ability. We stop insisting on our merits or our qualifications or anything like that. Brother Zach has said, God cannot use a man until he has broken him. And what I see here is that the Lord's commitment to breaking Peter. The Lord was committed and the Lord's committed to breaking each one of us. No one who has not seen their complete and total inadequacy is fit to serve the Lord. I'll say that again. If you haven't seen your total inadequacy, you aren't fit to serve the Lord. And so what does the Lord do? In his mercy, he leads us into circumstances that bring us to nothing, that empty us of all confidence that we had. And he wants to bring us to this point where I can't even answer you, Lord. I can't believe I feel you gave me the simplest job. You had one job. That's like a phrase in the world. You had one job. All you asked me to do is keep watching, pray for an hour. I couldn't even do that. He wants to bring us a point to the point where we don't know how to answer him. And it's so important that the Lord bring us here, especially, I would say, and this is something I've been experiencing in my own life in this past week, especially when he sees an attitude of superiority in any way, he wants to empty us. What did Peter say? Even if all these other guys fall away, all these other, he's not talking about the world. He's talking about the other disciples. 
But what did Peter have? He had a sense of superiority, a sense of confidence in himself as distinguished from the other disciples. Is there any sin, brother or sister, that you think is beyond you in some way? You're in danger of being like Peter. Is there any heartache that you see someone else dealing with and you think that wouldn't bother me? That you think you're above some heartache or some sin or something like that? You're in danger of being like Peter. We can all, we can see, it's so easy to see how somebody else is experiencing something and think, I wouldn't struggle with that. That wouldn't bother me if that situation happened to me. But until God brings us face to face with our own inadequacy, our own total inability, our total corruption in our flesh, he can't accomplish his highest purpose in us. And what I see is even when Peter was insistent, what you say about me denying you is not right. Jesus didn't give up on him, but he didn't just bring him along and say, you're doing great. He brought him to circumstances that showed him what he believed about himself was false. And the Lord wants to bring us to circumstances that show us this thing you believe about yourself, totally off. He wants to allow us to be sifted. That's one thing Jesus says to Peter in another gospel. Satan's demanded to sift you like wheat. And none of us are beyond being sifted. We all need to be sifted. Jesus in a, in a different gospel says that everyone, I'm gonna, I'm gonna empty my threshing floor and everyone is going to be sifted. You know, he says, my winnowing fork, I think John the Baptist says this, his winnowing fork in his hand is in his hand. And I don't know if you've seen this picture. I saw, I didn't know what a winnowing, we, we don't live in an agrarian society. So you go, well, what does that mean? I watched a YouTube video. You can always find the answer on YouTube. And I watch a farmer just take a huge scoop of grain. You know, he does, he throws it into the air and all the chaff blows away. It's all light as a feather and the real wheat falls to the ground. And what Jesus said is, everyone, my, my threshing, my, uh, my winnowing fork is in my hand. Everyone will be sifted. Everyone's life is going to get tossed into the air. And you know what the Lord wants to see? Do you blow away or is there real substance that causes you to fall back into the barn, so to speak? Anytime, I, I was blessed by this realization this week. Because we can have this thought, you know, something can happen. You go, wow, I'm not nearly as brave as I thought I was. Like I had, I mean, I just thought of this right now. We were camping recently and a tree limb fell. There's a child standing in front of me. And in my mind, you go, hey, what happens if a tree limb falls and there's a child nearby? I think, oh, I, I sacrifice life and limb. I push them out of the way. You know what I did? I was shocked and didn't even move. That's a silly, trivial example, but the point is, there are these moments that the Lord brings us in our lives. He goes, you think you're brave? And I find it such a gift. That's a, again, that's a silly example, but there are significant examples where in our own way, we go, I'm not nearly as brave as I thought I was. I'm not nearly as strong as I thought I was. I'm not nearly as humble or as dependent upon the Lord or as joyful, fill in the blank, right? We have all these ideas about our merits and our worth and our good attributes. It is a gift. It's a great thing when the Lord brings us into circumstances where we say, I'm not nearly as blank as I thought I was. Because you know God's goal? That we stop thinking we're great in any way. And he allows us, he takes the winnowing fork and he tosses us into the air to show us there's a little bit of greatness in your heart. You had a little bit of an idea that you're great in some way. You're joyful. You're kind. He, and he allows the person to cut you off. What is that? Winnowing fork. Toss you in the air. I'm not as kind as I thought I was. Good. It's good for you to go down. God wants to bring us to the point that we say, I can't even answer you, Lord. I just blew up at another person who cut me off on my way to New Covenant Christian Fellowship. Good. Rejoice that the Lord is revealing your lack. That's, and, it's, and why do I say it? Because it's evidence he's still working on you. He wants to finish the work that he started. And he's got to bring us to these sifting circumstances. Going back to the story now, hopefully your finger was still there. Verse 39. Or sorry, verse 41. Look at this. It says, he came back a third time. So it's after the Lord brought Peter to the point of speechlessness. And it's very important. 
dear brothers and sisters, don't stop listening now. Because the Lord does want to bring us to the point of speechlessness, but that's not all he wants to do. It says in verse 41 that he came a third time and said, are you still sleeping? And we know that they were. They didn't heed two of his warnings, two of his admonitions to watch and pray. But what I see here and what blessed me is just to think about this whole story. We see Peter asserts it. Jesus warns Peter and Peter asserts his faithfulness. Then Jesus singles him out and says, no, really, you're in danger. And he insists he's not. But instead of abandoning him, as you and I might do, Jesus keeps him along. He brings him along, but not to build him up, but to break him down and to show him his lack. And he brings him into circumstances that reveal his lack. And he gives him a chance after a chance after a chance. And he brings him to the point where he's speechless, but he gives him another chance. What does that tell me? God's ultimate goal isn't to bring us to the point where we're speechless. His ultimate goal is to bring us beyond speechlessness somewhere. And what this spoke to me was that Jesus let them again, not only to reveal their need, but to bring them somewhere else. I feel they failed God's purpose here. I feel that is, I mean, obviously his desire wasn't for them to ever fall asleep, but I think they missed out. You know what I wish for when he, when he came back the second time and they're speechless You know what I wish they had said? I wish they had said, if you turn with me, hold your finger in Mark 14. But if you turn with me to Exodus 33, there's a prayer here that's really, I think, the prayer that I wish they would have prayed and I wish I would pray. Because this is a point where the Lord's telling Moses how he's going to lead the people. And if you look at verse 12, Exodus 33, verse 12, Moses says, he's, he's having a very honest conversation with the Lord here. He says, Lord, you say to me, bring up this people, but you haven't let me know who you're going to send with me. You haven't let me know who you're going to send with me. And then if you look at verse 15, he's, it says, then Moses said to him, if you don't go with us, don't leave us up. Don't lead us up from here. He's talking about the wilderness. If you don't lead us, if your presence doesn't go with us, we'd rather stay in the wilderness. And I see there, what does Moses cherish most of all? God's presence. You know what I wish Peter had said to the Lord? Don't leave. If you leave me, I can't keep watch. Will you pray with me? I wish Peter had said that. You can leave a thousand times, Lord, and I will keep falling asleep. There's no way I can keep watch unless you help me. Will you? Just like Moses, if you don't lead us up from here, we don't even want to leave. And ultimately what God wants to do, he doesn't just want to bring us to the point of speechlessness, certainly, but he wants us to be so hopeless that we actually turn to him and say, you're my only hope. It's not a matter of repetitions. I'm not going to get better with more, leave me. I'm just going to keep getting worse. Uh, But if you stay with me, I am convinced. That's an important word, convinced. That's what Paul says. Are you familiar with that expression where Paul says, I am convinced? Look with me at 2 Timothy chapter 1. This is the attitude that I I wish I have in the light of this failure. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12. Paul says, for this reason, I also suffer these things, but I'm not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and I'm convinced he's able to guard what I have entrusted him till that day. I know the Lord, and I know that if I ask him for help, he will definitely help me. I'm convinced. And so even as I'm convinced of your warning, Lord, I will deny you. Even though I'm convinced of your warning that I can't keep watch and pray, yet I'm also convinced that if you, if I entrust myself to you, that's what Paul says, I'm convinced he's able to guard what I've entrusted to him. My own faithfulness, Lord, I cast it into your hands. I cast myself entirely upon you. Will you keep watch and pray with me? Remember, this is, it's not in this gospel, but in John, what we know right before the Garden of Gethsemane, you know, Jesus says to his disciples, I'm going to send a helper and he'll be with you. I wish the disciples had longed for the help of the helper in that moment. They said, Lord, you've promised you'd send me a helper. You've already shown me twice. I can't keep watch and pray. Will you send me a helper right now? Why wait, Lord? That's the attitude. It's the Lord wants to bring us past speechlessness 
to ultimately faithfully declaring his sufficiency, his ability, his worth, his willingness to help us. That's what the Lord wants for us. It's not enough to just stop declaring my own worth and to admit that I'm incapable. It's not enough to be silenced in my own insistence. I have to be moved from or move, you know, from insisting on my ability to not just speechlessness, not just silence, but to boldly declaring his worth and let his ability be my insistence. I insist you are able. I am convinced you can keep what I've entrusted to you. So in love, God wants to reveal our lack. I'm just summing up what I said. He wants to reveal our lack. He wants us to be totally speechless in ourselves but then he wants to bring us beyond speechlessness, ultimately to be fully confident in him and fully dependent upon him. And it's a blessing. Last thing, last verse that I'll point to is Luke chapter 22. It's a blessing to see that before the sifting ever begins, before this whole situation begins, the Lord allowed it for a purpose. He allowed it to ultimately to build the church. It says, if you look at me at Luke 22, verse 31, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. But I've prayed for you that your faith may not fail, and that you, once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. And God's desire is that we would pass through that period of sifting, pass through that period of becoming nothing, and remaining nothing, by the way, be strengthened in our confidence in him so that we could strengthen others. This Peter, who he knew was going to fail, what was his prayer? That you'd be able to strengthen others. That's his prayer and his desire for us too. Not just that we'd be convinced of our inability, but that we'd be convinced of his ability. And we'd be so convinced we'd be a source of strength. That's God's desire. But you know what it requires? In the middle of verse 32, when you have turned again, turn again. I love that phrase. He says, when you've turned again, strengthen your brothers. And I want to say to, to myself and to you, dear brothers and sisters, turn again. Turn again from your sense of self-worth, your self-confidence, whatever you thought you were enough of. Turn again. And turn again from only being speechless. And turn again to boldly declaring by faith what God has promised. That he'll pour out his spirit upon us. That we can be a blessing. Turn again. Strengthen your brothers. I'm blessed to see how the Lord worked with Peter. I'm blessed to see he didn't give up on a failure and that he didn't just empty, emptily comfort the failure, but that he kept emptying the failure until not, Jesus saw Peter was unable. Peter needed to see he was unable. And the Lord stuck with him until he saw it. And he stuck with him until he saw Jesus face and he was reminded of his words and he turned again and he was able by the power of the Holy Spirit to strengthen his brothers. That's God's desire for all of us in the church and in our lives. So I pray that he would do that and help us do it.